Okay, so thank you for the, uh, all for coming. Um, so this is going to be a set of lectures, either three or four, not sure yet, on black hole microstates and state theory. And the the main theme of the lectures is well starts begins from the fact that um, well, from the discovery of Bekenstein and Hawking and others. Can you all hear me? Just tell me if uh, to speak up if not. In the 1970s, that's where the story starts. Um, they discovered that black holes have thermodynamic properties. But you can associate the temperature and entropy to a black hole. Now, why is this a big deal? Um, well, firstly, in the classical theory of uh, general so relativity. The the okay, so I'll just I'll continue anyway. Um, so, in classical here, uh, black holes are supposed to be black. So, Bakingstein, Hawking, and others uh, discovered that black holes are thermodynamic properties. Um, and it was, uh, it was quite a discovery because in classical GR, um, black holes are black. Things fall in, nothing comes out. And thermodynamic properties means that they have temperature and entropy, and in particular, they radiate at some temperature. This temperature is proportional to H bar, the purely quantum effect. Now, why is this a big deal? Um, it's a big deal because I mean, maybe an analogy will help. In, in the late 19th century, physicists were studying gases. This is before quantum theory. They knew the gas was something inside the room, and they could measure state parameters, energy, entropy, temperature, okay, and they could figure out relations between these parameters. And this was a vital clue in, in so, uh, for the discovery of, of, of quantum mechanics. Okay. So quantum mechanics had clues coming from looking at the atomic spectrum, but also thermodynamics. Okay. It's what led to the ideas of Boltzmann and quantum statistical mechanics. So at the broad level, it was important. It's just the, the, in one line, it's the fact that the air in this room is made up of a number of microscopic states. Okay, those states are the quantum states, which then quantum mechanics formalized. Uh, and it also gave quantitative proofs. Right? So like the fact that the entropy is extensive, okay, that's, a, that's a macroscopic observation. But that leads to this n factorial of the Gibbs, if you've, if you've seen this. And it, it shows that particles are uh, indistinguishable in the quantum theory. That, I, I'm saying that when you write the grand canonical uh, partition function, you have to divide by, by n factorial, which is Higgs paradox. Okay, particles are indistinguishable, which then in quantum mechanics leads to the fact that wave functions are symmetric. Okay, so there's some very sharp clues coming as well. Your, the total energy should be finite. If you want to avoid this ultraviolet catastrophe, it means that there must be a microscopic cutoff. Okay, that's what led to the Planck's constant. Okay, things like this. So when Bakers and Hawking found that black holes are thermodynamics, um, that gives us clues about the underlying quantum theory, because black holes are solutions to GR, it's the underlying quantum theory of gravity, or quantum theory of space. Okay, that's why sort of philosophically it's very important. And it, the fact that black holes are thermodynamics continues to be one of our main quantitative clues in, in understanding quantum gravity. Okay, um, so one of the big questions was if a black hole has entropy, like the air in this room, then it should be made up of a number of microscopic states, and what are these microscopic states? What are the quantum states? Um, and string theory has made a lot of progress on this question for a class of supersymmetric black holes, a class of black holes called supersymmetric black holes, um, where you can enumerate these microscopic states. And then you can verify that the Boltzmann formula is correct. You count these states, there's some statistical entropy, and this thermodynamic entropy. You can check that these two agree with each other. So that's roughly the goal of these lectures. Um, to give you, um, so to explain all this, what I just said, um, and to show some examples of, of um, the statistical entropy counting, um, and then to give you some tools to try uh, to read more advanced. Okay. Any questions at any point of time, just speak up, it'll help me, especially if I'm sort of going too fast or something. Alright, so just tell me how slow. Okay, so today's lecture will be not about string theory or statistical mechanics, it will be purely black hole thermodynamics. So my assumption is that all of you have
studied at least a little bit, have done one course or two courses hopefully in quantum field theory and in GR. So that, if that's not right, can you just speak up? Master students maybe not, but uh, ask questions. If, uh, otherwise, it's more or less, that's the background of everybody. Okay, so <coughs> let's begin then. Uh, so let's start with this question. One minus two gm over r. M is the parameter of the black hole. So the solution has one parameter m, <coughs> um, which is radial coordinates t r and theta phi for the measurement space time. That's dr square over one minus two gm over r. I don't know if you guys can see, but try to read out. Plus r square d omega two square. This is the two sphere d theta square plus sine square theta d phi square. Okay, so Everything I say will be directly symmetric, and if necessary, we'll use this notation. <coughs> is this how it is? Can you guys see in the back? And is there, I mean, for me, there's a reflection, though. Yeah, you're okay? <laughs> or if this is better, I can just continue going on that. So stop me. So that's a solution, um, the solution of vacuum Einstein's equation. Okay. And now remember that um, we call the, the weak field approximation in, in <coughs> the R, the weak field. Okay, that if we have a mass, point mass m, small m, okay, then at large distance r, the metric d00 component of the metric which says e to the 2 times the Newtonian potential. The phi is the Newtonian potential, which is g n over r. Sorry, small m. Okay? So for any point mass, we'll behave like this, minus g n over r. Yeah. I think we could write in the upper parts of the board because it's hard to see. Yeah. Yeah, okay, so, so I just, why don't I, if you tell me how much, like here? Yeah, yeah. that's good. Okay. Same thing here. Or is this better? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you. All right. Uh, okay. So I just say what I wrote here. I said weak field. So this is a weak field approximation of G. Yeah, if I have a point mass, then very far from it when the gravitational fields are weak. Essentially, you have the Newtonian approximation. So g00 goes as e to the 2 pi. If you compare this with um, the large r expansion of this metric, you will find that m is the mass of the black. Planet, then this solution is still a solution outside 
the, the radius of the star. So I'll start the Earth's surface. So it just uses spherical symmetry. symmetry. But once you start hitting matter, then of course, uh, the vacuum Einstein, you have to put a team union on the right hand side. So the solution will change. Whereas the Schwarzschild solution is a solution all the way up to r equal to zero. Now this becomes it again, um, with no matter at all. Okay, so, so now all the matter is collapsed, and inside the horizon is going inside the horizon, and maybe all the way to the single atom. Right, that's, that's the picture. And just to give you an estimate, so this 2GM is called the Schwarzschild radius. That's the Call the radius of the horizon or Schwarzschild radius. I call it R H for now. Okay. Um, for a black hole with the mass of, a, of the sun, that's about two or three kilometers. So it's way, way, way inside the sun. Uh, that's why the sun is not a black hole. Okay. The radiation pressure keeps the matter out. Uh, um, now let's uh, look at this a little bit more. So if you look at, so it's a solution of vacuum Einstein's equation. So that means that the Ricci scalar is zero, R mu nu is zero. So Ricci scalar is zero, the contraction of that. Okay. Uh, of course, Riemann is not zero, otherwise you would have an unclear solution. And the first non-zero scalar to make is this scalar, so the question scalar. That is proportional to one over r to the sixth times the constant forty-eight m square. Okay. So you can see that r equal to zero is a curvature singularity, um, but r equal to two m um, is not a curvature singularity. Okay. It's perfectly well behaved. Um, while the metric looks singular, g zero zero goes to zero. But g r r goes to infinity. Um, so a priori r equal to 2m is, is a special point. But whatever it is, it's not a curvature singularity. So in order to analyze that, um, we make some coordinate transformations to um, remove the coordinate singularity of r equal to So the way you do that is, um, so you look at, so this is M and R, you look at photons which are going in gradually inwards. So photons means you put d s square equal to zero, and radial means that there's no angular variation. <coughs> so this gives you dt plus dr. Uh, over 1 minus Gm over R uh, equal to 0. Okay, plus or minus, it doesn't matter. So if you integrate that, you get um, less some integration constant V0, V0 minus T equals R plus Gm about R minus. And this right hand side is called a star, that's a perfect coordinate. Okay. Uh, that means ingoing photons are labeled by a number V0. If V0 is constant, you have an ingoing photon. Um, and now, you write a family of ingoing photons, so you just vary V. So V is the integration constant of this. So you just get V, is T plus R star, that's called the Eddington Fulbrookstein ingoing coordinate. And um, you know, the, the metric in this coordinate is minus 1 minus 2 d m over R, I just get R implicit dv square plus 2 dv dr. Sorry, excuse me, v and R are my coordinates, R is fine, uh, plus R square. Now you see in this metric, in these coordinates, there's no singularity at r equal to gm. This is zero, but it's okay. 
Um, and this singularity allows us to, uh, sorry, this, these coordinates allows us to understand the structure of um, the DCs. Okay. So that's about it, that's R. Now, Draw the other side out going the other side. Far away, of course, it looks like this. Okay. And what happens when you go close to the horizon is that once you go inside the horizon, it's going like that. Okay. So this light cone. shows the ingoing and the outgoing. You just see, if you follow it, you see that what happens is it starts to tip. And over here, both the, both the ingoing and the outgoing are pointing inward. Okay. So this horizon is the place where that happens. The light cone tips. R becomes time-like inside the horizon. Uh, that's what I want to say. So the singularity, which is r equal to zero, that's still true, um, is a time-like singularity. Uh, sorry, space-like singularity. It's a point in time. So r is time-like. Okay. So r equal to zero means it's a fixed point in time, not in space. Okay. So that's the funny thing inside the black hole. And the singularity is some spatial slice. Okay. Um, any questions so far? Is this, this should have been familiar to most of you, is that more or less correct? Right. Just say no, it's not. Okay, now, <clears throat> um, then we want to draw the causal structure. Uh, we want to formalize all this. And to do that, we, we use a Penrose diagram. So V was e plus R star and U minus R star, um, and then a key one comment here is that if you treat, so these coordinates have the range uh, minus infinity, V can be minus infinity to infinity, and R is 0 to infinity, okay. uh, this does not, so if you draw the space time with these ranges, you find that it's geodesically incomplete. That you you have geodesics which are hitting the boundaries at finite time point. Finite point of okay. So the way to fix that is that you go to the true star coordinates. So V is e to the small v over 4 m and u big u is e to the minus small u over 4 m. Now you see when, when V goes to, from minus to infinity, big V still goes from zero to infinity, and you can extend that to big V being negative. Okay. So that's the Pascal extension. We write x is t at 
x is u plus v and t is minus v. Singularity that's r equal to 2m, that's r equal to 2m. This is called r plus, called minus. and so give you a sense of those coordinates. Does everyone know what the Penrose diagram is? Can you just raise your hand? If not, sorry, if not. Or raise your hand if you know, because that way then I can see the complement and it will be fine. Yeah, thanks. So, so the answer is more, more or less all of you know. These ones, these green lines are uh, u times v uh, equals constant. It's r equal to constant in the original coordinates. T equal to constant goes like this. Uh, that's u times v equal to 0. So that's r equal to 2m is u times v equal to 0. So u equal to 0, v equal to 0. And that's the singularity. Okay, so that's um, future null infinity, past null infinity. And now you can see that this is the horizon. It's very clear in this picture. Um, so, sorry, I should have said this. I, I, I drew this picture just directly by looking at this metric because this is essentially flat. So that's how I got T and X are the T plus X and T minus X. U and V are the light cone curves. Up to some. Uh, conformal factor. <coughs> and you can see now that this is the horizon r equals to m because if you're behind the horizon, so if you're outside the horizon, then outgoing rays reach stride plus, but ingoing rays go in and the singularity as you would expect. But if you're inside the horizon, then both outgoing and ingoing will fall back into the singularity. Okay. That's the way to think about it. So physically, if you want, the singularity, it's like the horizon, is the place where light rays, so outside the horizon, light rays can escape. Inside the horizon, light rays, even if they're moving outward, don't escape. The gravitational pull is such that they always don't fall in. And the horizon is the place where the light rays are just, they just keep going outward, and just, they just stay on the horizon. That's, that's the okay. So the horizon is a null surface. Okay. Of that you can immediately see from here. Um, it's a, you can see from any of these coordinates. Sorry to say, this is zero. Dv is zero. So it's a null, sorry, the dv square coefficient is zero. So the horizon is a null surface. What it is? Um, so sometimes in popular uh, descriptions, you see, you see that a black hole is a is a region of space time and so much gravity that nothing can escape and nothing can lie. It's kind of correct, but this is the correct relativistic way to say it. Horizon is a null surface. 
And from that, the light rays sort of are always moving out. And, and the, the, that locus is the horizon, the stay fixed at the horizon. Okay, so it's a null hypersurface. Okay. And in this case, you can also see that it's stationary. This horizon doesn't change. There's no T dependence. Okay, so stationary null hypersurface. So all these things we will pick up on. Now, <clears throat> that's uh, the black hole. Uh, of course, there's not a physical black hole. Here there's some white hole region. Um, and, and in the physical region, um, so if you, instead if you have a collapsing star, you have something like that. <laughs> okay, so the collapsing star does that. That's just r equal to zero. It's a completely smooth point. It's the, it's the origin of space. That's the singularity. That's tri plus. That's tri minus, and the horizon. So that I call this h plus. So the future horizon is the past horizon. All right. That's the collapsing star. <coughs> All right. So, any questions so far? So, this is also supposed to be more or less review in the few advanced facts. So the, the way to say that is correct way to say that is that I mean that's a good point. Is that I mean it's a weird thing if you think about it. This is a collapsing shell of dust, and at some point you realize that you already have a horizon. And the, the reason is that the, the notion of a horizon is not a at least in GR in this way of doing it, it's not a local concept, it's a global concept. Um, notion of a horizon requires the full space time it requires the knowledge of future infinity. So that's a, if you've not seen this, it's your to sort of predict that we had done it. Um, indeed, and that's going to be important. Okay. Other comments, questions? 
Yeah, I hope that point is clear that in order to draw the horizon, I need the full Penrose diagram. So only then I can split it into regions saying this is inaccessible. I mean, the physical reason is that if you're somewhere here, it could be that in the future, you know, there's some other evolution, dynamical evolution, that puts me inside the horizon. So that's why you need the, the knowledge of future infinity. Is there um, a meaning to the part of the singularity at the top that's not inside of the grid? So not inside of the No, so in fact, once you're behind the horizon, I mean, whether or not there's a green here <coughs> is a bit artificial because you can't, you know, you can't really probe it. Okay. So that's the analytic solution. People write that, but maybe, in fact, maybe this is a good way to start finding. Other questions? Okay, very good. Um, then let me go to Reisner Nostrum. So here, the, we're studying a theory of a metric coupled to a matchup. Okay. So Einstein Maxwell theory. And the rational notion solution is a black hole solution in this theory. D square is I guess tell you where I'm going. So the first week discussion was to set up the notions of horizon and things like that, and more or less should have been familiar. Reisman Nostrum maybe is familiar, maybe not. I'm sure fans have you seen the Reisman Nostrum solution before? Okay, no fans going down, that's that's what I expected. Um, and then uh, the, this discussion is very similar to first year. Okay. And once we finish this, we'll go we'll on to the discussion of uh, entropy and thermodynamics. Okay, so I just want these two examples to be there um, to see what we are studying. So, this. so minus f of r dt squared plus dr squared over f of r plus r squared d omega t squared. Um, <coughs> where f of r is a function I'll write down in a second. And now I also have to write the gauge field. So the gauge field strength um, is an electric field. So this is like a point charge, q over r square, um, <coughs> being towards infinity. And f of r, uh, <coughs> FRT, q over r square, So these are one of these. These are black holes. So there's a horizon as before when f of r equal to zero. Okay, exactly the same type of, not exactly, but something like the same, something like that happens. The, the Penrose diagram is different. I'll, I'll write it in a second. But you can see that when f of r equal to zero, you have to start to reanalyze it because the <coughs> is singular. Turns out it's only a coordinate singularity if you, if you calculate the curvature. But f of r equal to zero is indeed the place where the light cone flips. Um, but this black hole is different from Schwarzschild in that it carries electric charge. You can just measure the electric charge by Gauss law. The answer is Q. More generally, you can have dionic black holes. Dionic black holes, which means that it carries M. So here M, I should have said it. So M equals mass as before, and Q equals charge. And M equal to mass is the same kind of calculation we did earlier. Go far from the black hole, do the weak field approximation, and speed off the Newtonian potential. Q, you can just do Gauss law. More generally, you can have electric and magnetic charges, M, Q, and P. Okay. Uh, and in this case, F, R, T is Q, R, R, square, 
and f is a phi is p sin theta. Okay, so this is a constant magnetic field, p sin theta. And this f of r now becomes one, uh, let's write it like this, one, let's write it like one minus r plus over r. It's quadratic in r, in one over r. So let's write it as one minus r plus over r times one minus r minus over r. Where um, r plus plus r minus equals to m, I've started to put g to the one. And r plus times r minus is two square plus two square. Okay? You can see that. When p is zero, that's exactly the same. Basically, this becomes q square plus p square. Uh, so the two roots are the roots of f of r equal to zero um, are r plus minus. We solve that we get m plus or minus square root of m square minus two square plus m square. So m square. In order for this to be regular, m square has to be greater than equal to p square plus p square. And r plus is called the outer horizon. So both these roots are very up horizons. So we have a light conflict. So when this notice that when there's no angular dependence, it's very easy to see where is the horizon. You just look at tr, it's like a two-dimensional problem. And if f of r equal to zero, you can see the light conflicts because if f of r is continuous, it hits zero. Moves from positive to negative, unless it's a double root. It's not the case. Okay, so it flips once and it flips again. So those are the inner and outer horizon. R plus is the outer horizon. R minus is the inner horizon. Um, and now there's a very special class of black holes called extremal black holes. Uh, sorry, I had this. Those diagrams somewhere. So, put on the famous diagram. So the horizons are like that, that's r plus. Okay. And now this goes like so. Now, there's a very special class of black holes called extremal black holes. Um, which is a limit of um, the Reisman Aston solution where R plus approaches R minus. So you tune the parameters. So the parameters are M, Q, and P. Okay. So you can think of that as m and r plus and r minus. You can tune them 
to bring them close to each other. Uh, and what that means is that, so in the limit, m square in the limit, m square equals two square plus three. Right? Everything is work out. <clears throat> so that means that these black holes are completely specified. By their charges. So the mass is given for the right? where, where is the charge meant to live in this black hole? Is it at the center? The charge is, yeah, so you have Q over R square, so it's like a point charge, that's the electric charge, and P is just a constant magnetic field, P sign. So a point charge by the similarity. The one over R equals zero, it's just Q over R square. It's like a electric charge at R But there's a singularity. Yeah. Right. So the ma it's like the mass. So you can ask where is the mass of the black hole? Yeah. Yeah. It's also, just take the short tube black hole. It's also the thing, right? Outside the the singularity, those are not my first comments, there's no matter. Right? So it's as if there's a point mass at the singularity. So of course these are classical notions because the gravitational fields become strong. But this is like a point charge at R equal to zero. That's yeah. Even in QED, you know, even in classical electrodynamics, that's singular. And in QED, something happens. Here, you would, you might so there's one line of thought you could pursue which is similar. In QED, there's a point charge here. You can ask what happens when you close to uh, go close to that, and then you know there are these vacuum shielding and this you know mm -hmm. renormalization of the charge and so on. You might have well, you might expect something similar happens when when you approach r equal to zero, the gravitational field becomes strong. Mm -hmm. So firstly, there'll be, whatever your theory, there'll be quantum effects, quantum gravitational effects. Yeah. Okay? Proportional, like, measured by the, proportional to the curvature. What, what is interesting about black holes is that before any of that happens, you hit the horizon. Mm -hmm. The horizon, when M is large, the curvature of the horizon is very weak. Mm -hmm. right? Remember, R was M square R to the sixth. Mm -hmm. right? So the, the, mystery and fun about black holes is that seeing a weak curvature, you, you start to see very interesting effects, which turn out to be related to the quantum theory, but not in the sense that we use It's not some renormalization of mass. Mm -hmm. Because of the fact that the causal structure is staying. Okay. Um, so that's that. And now one interesting thing, which I may or may not, I probably won't use this, but you might have seen this and I want to, or you will see this, in addition, it's worth seeing, is that, um, so here's an exercise, that if you take an extreme of that hole, um, the, if you fix t equal to constant, okay, I'm just going to say this already, so fix t equal to constant, and calculate the proper distance <coughs> to the horizon. That diverges, that's it. Okay, this is an exercise which you're doing. And that suggests that near the horizon, so what this means is that if you're near the horizon, proper distance is, is infinite to, to, to go there. That suggests that near the, that the region near the horizon um, is itself somehow has an independent life. Okay, this is some philosophical way of thinking about it. What it means in practice is that um, you can take a limit which, where you can decouple that region from the rest of the space. This is a consistent limit. And this is not true for general black holes. If you try to do this for Schwarzschild, you'll, that's another exercise, you'll not be able to do what I'm going to do now. So take R equals R plus plus epsilon R tilde. I'm going to take epsilon to zero at the end. Okay. And T is uh, T tilde over epsilon times R plus square. And if you plug this into the metric, you can check, you should check that ds square has this form. It's r square, r plus square, and of course I'm taking r plus plus to r. Okay, there's only one parameter r plus. So ds square is r plus square times minus r tilde square, d tilde square plus d r tilde square over r tilde square. 
plus uh, plus nothing is important times the omega. Okay. Plus this is the limit. Uh, so times times um, one plus O of x times. Okay. One plus O of x times squared, which means that if you take epsilon to zero, you consistently get this. Okay, you can't do this in general. And this solution is very interesting. So I want you to recognize it. That's a two-dimensional and you see the space in S2, and that's just two-dimensional sphere. Okay? So both of them have constant surface, constant surface. Okay, so there's a factorization of the geometry in the class of an SD model. Okay, and in this, so there's a factorized form. F becomes uh, so that was the metric, and you have f r theta t theta equals q, and f theta pi equals the sign. Okay, so there's constant electric and magnetic fields. So the region near the horizon is the second. Okay, let's repeat what I did. If you, this is a consistent way to decouple the, the configuration near the horizon. And what you get is that the metric is ADS2 times S2 of constant curvature on the top of the curvature set by the horizon scale and constant electric and magnetic fields. Yeah. But I zoomed in on the horizon, but in the global plane, is the singularity still within the time frame? Okay, so that's that's a very interesting question. Um, <coughs> Can you draw a pen diagram? Uh, yeah, so in fact, I think I'm going to say I don't understand this extremely well. Um, there are things you can say about it. What, what, what has happened is that you so firstly these two things have come close to each other, and then you have some, some kind of so firstly you can draw some extremal limit of this where one side is like that and you just have you you probably seen this thing okay, like that. And basically what happens is that you it's, it's that region that is being captured. So now that there's no singularity, it's perfectly smooth here. So the horizon, yeah, where maybe one way to say it is that, yeah, nothing. So here you show the near horizon geometry in four D, which is that which is appears with the AES two factor. Is this this extend to say the ND? Is it always an AES two in the near horizon? Yeah, so that's right. So that's the general treatment. If you start with the weakly curved solution of here. And take the extremal limit, that's weakly curved black hole solution of GR, and take the extremal limit, then you always get ADS2, ADS2 times. Oh, so there's always an ADS2 current, not an ADS2. Alright, other questions? I'll just erase this for you. That is that. So today we will not discuss extremal black holes again. Uh, but they'll come back next week. Any other questions? So what's the time? I spoke for almost an hour. I spoke for one hour? Uh, no, I don't take a break. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let me do a little more, and then we'll take a break. Uh, unless it's like a pressing thing. Are you okay? I just wanted to... Let me start. Yeah, it's not much. I, I start with the argument for, for black hole thermodynamics and not without details, and that's it. Let me come back. Alright? I'm pretty democratic. You can, uh, I mean, I, I, I have the last veto, but you can tell me if that's not a good idea. Now, so you say that 
vehicles. There is an associate temperature and then enthalpy turning black hole and the black hole radiates at that temperature. Okay. So what's the argument? So even if you didn't follow some of the things there, it's completely okay. What I'm going to say is it has a slightly different flavor. You can ask me to do it. So the argument, the first argument was, well, there were many things going on at the time. Okay. So, um, Firstly, in, um, so there was one line of thought which was classical GR, which led to what I call the loss of black hole mechanics. This will discuss after the break. But just purely by considerations of black, uh, classical general, saying what happens to a black hole as it evolves. So you have to study these Penrose diagrams a little better and things like that. It's a very technical thing. People realize that the area of the black hole always increases. Um, in any process. If you throw something in, the horizon increases, the radius of the horizon. Uh, or mergers, the total area, the final black hole, is greater than or equal to the sum of the area. So this reminds you of, of entropy. The only thing that increases in life is entropy. So if there's something like that which is always increasing, then the natural guess is that it should be some kind of entropy. So that was one line of thought. So purely formal analogy to entropy. There was also the analogy to the zeroth and first law of uh, thermodynamics. We will discuss this after the break. So the other side, um, so this was uh, Hawking, uh, Bardeen, Carter, and all these GRP. Around, it was like really one, one year. For, I think the laws of the black hole mechanics paper came first, and then very soon was Bekenstein, and then Hawking, and then and so on. Um, so Bekenstein was, so he was set this problem by his thesis advisor. Um, what happens to the loss of thermodynamics uh, in the presence of a black hole? So uh, Wheeler was his advisor and um, so graduate students at Princeton were, like Wheeler had this always set of five problems. He would say you're always welcome to come and discuss. Oh, yes. <laughs> Did you do this kind of yeah. Okay, so he used to give this set of problems and he'd come and Half of them look completely weird and crazy. So this is one of those things. And what happens to loss of black hole thermodynamics in, in the present? Uh, sorry, thermodynamics in the present of life. And Wittgenstein was crazy enough to accept it, but he came up with this extremely profound uh, argument. It's, it's very simple. So consider a universe with a black hole in it, and you throw something in. That something should have entropy and energy, and you throw it into the black hole. You ask what happens to the uh, thermodynamics. So the first law of thermodynamics is energy conservation. Right? Imagine that some system where there's no work from outside, there's some universe, black hole, and there's something inside the system and it falls into the black hole. Okay? So divide the, the space-time into inside and outside the horizon. So from outside the horizon you lose energy, but that energy enters the black hole, the radius increases, and the mass therefore increases. Okay? And one can show, and that's part of the next discussion, that um, the mass increases exactly so as to compensate for the mass being thrown, thrown in from outside. Okay, so the loss of energy from outside is equal to gain of energy from the black hole. Okay, so the first law of thermodynamics is fine. This is, <clears throat> as you would expect, because as I emphasized, the mass of the black hole is really measured from infinity. It's the ADM mass of the Newtonian okay, So if something falls in, it's the same. Imagine a point particle just outside the horizon, some shell outside the horizon, there's a mass conservation. The second law that is the interesting thing, um, it would, ah sorry, I should have said something before this. So before this I want to say something, um, let's hold that thought. So I discussed Schwarzschild black holes which have mass, and Breisman also black holes which have mass and charge. Okay. Um, there's another black hole I did not discuss called the curved black hole, uh, which came about, so Schwarzschild came, I think 19, sorry, two years after Einstein's equations. This came uh, not much later, about this thing, but less than 10 years later, 5 years or something like that. And you can see why, they're more or less the same type of solution. And Kerr was in 1960, which is many, many years to, to write it down. It's because it's a very complicated solution. Um, so by that time, when Kerr wrote down the solution, uh, black holes were labeled by, by mass, um, 
charge, electromagnetic is the that and the end of spin. Then people started writing investigating theorems. Is this all? So already before that, it would show that if you have spherical symmetry, so no spin, no spin, then there's some kind of uniqueness theorem. So for the Schwarzschild, you would have learned this. There's, if there's no, I mean, that's how we construct the Schwarzschild solution. We impose spherical symmetry, and that's the unique solution with one parameter n. Something similar for MNQ, and when you have spin, then you need clearly more, the problem becomes technically complicated, but roughly speaking, that's the spirit of these no hair theorems. That there's, a, there's some kind of uniqueness. It's not quite true, especially when you have spin, but more or less it's, it's something like that. Now, let's come back to this. Um, so what happens to entropy? So you throw in something, so you lose entropy from the outside world, but now once this cup of tea or something has fallen inside the black hole, um, it might get into some transient, it will die down. At the end of the day, you again have a solution of that type. Okay? Just completely specified by the uh, quantum, conserved quantum. That is the opposite of something having entropy. It's like an elementary part. There is no degrees of freedom. It's completely specified by its quantum. Maybe a few spin degrees of freedom. Or something like that. Okay? So it would seem that you lose entropy from the outside world unless you assign an entropy to the black hole itself. Okay, that, that's what the argument is. And this would be, you throw something inside the black hole, because you can't see, because there's no causal connection from inside the black hole coming out, you can't, whatever had all these degrees of freedom of the T went in and you can't measure that. And if you want to save the second law of thermodynamics, it means that the black hole itself must have an entropy. That's how the argument is. And um, so black hole must have must have entropy. And moreover, if you want to save the second law of thermodynamics, it must be that the total entropy, the variation of the black hole entropy, plus I'm going to call it matter, the entropy of the of the stuff stuff outside, that should always increase. That's what the second law says. So this thing is called the generalized second law of thermodynamics. Okay, this is due to Bekenstein. Uh, <clears throat> and this means, for instance, that it means something extraordinary physically. Because we imagine a process where delta S matter is negative. Okay, so you're throwing something in, so you lose entropy from the outside. Okay. What this means is that the delta S plus hole must be positive, of course, to compensate for that, and must be in magnitude must be larger than what you lost. Okay, only then you can satisfy this inequality, larger inequality. Right? If you want the sum to be positive. This, one, if this is negative, this one better be positive and at least equal to that amount. And that means that now instead of a cup of tea, you can throw in something else. Throw in an elephant, you can throw in quark gluon plasma, whatever you want. It means that the nature of a black hole is such that it's, it, it's able to store entropy much better than anything else in the universe. Okay? It's a very profound state. Like for that. Um, one more thing, and I'll stop. Um, okay, don't. Let, if I finish this blackboard, don't let me go on. What happens to uh, like when the star crashes into a black hole? Take it when? When a star crashes into a black hole. Uh -huh. Like what? It's the same thing. The star has entropy. The black hole yeah. has at least that much entropy. Oh, okay. But it could be more. Could be more. Okay. Yeah. Where would that? Where would the extra entropy come from? Where does? Where the air in this room? If you measure the entropy in this room, okay. there are people who talk a lot. There is entropy. <laughs> I know it. That's <laughs> I'm kidding. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that creates entropy. Where is that coming from? It's, Energy is being conserved, but that's the second law. 
this is really like the second law, but that, that's what I want to discuss in the second part of the lecture. That comes from the laws of classical GR. That, that's the amazing part of it. It's not quantum, but I mean a priori, but then it, it looks like there's some quantum sets coming. So to, so to the outside observer, throwing something in, yeah. would they would never see that thing across the horizon. Right, that's a separate thing. That's a separate thing, but you can always measure things from it. Right, so you're saying that the, for an observer at infinity, it takes infinite yeah. time to reach the horizon. Right. Then you can have, you know, infolding observers for which it's not true. Mm -hmm. It takes finite time to reach the horizon. But the fact is that from infinity, you can measure conserved quantities. You can measure mass. As we'll see, there's a notion of temperature. There's temperature and energy, then there's energy. So John. So then you attributing the energy to the right. To the left one. Yeah. It's the, the fact that for one observer it takes infinite time. Um, I mean that that's behind a lot of the puzzles of black holes. Yeah. But um, the space-time is not causally um, complete if you excise the region behind the horizon. That's what you spend time. So things can easily fall in in the if you have a clock that is falling in, the clock will take one yeah. Okay, so um, right, so you need entropy, so the vacuum must have entropy. And, and from classical GR, there were these area theorems. Uh, area theorems. So just around the time, one year behind, uh, before that, said that the delta area of the horizon in any physical process is always positive. Okay. Now so that's why Bekenstein, uh, he said that S black hole is proportional to some constant times the area of the black hole. You want some, so he knew that there was, there must be some property of the black hole which is, it acts like entropy. Um, ah, it can't be the mass, so you, so you might try to guess, say what is it? So from the Schwarzschild solution there's only one parameter which is the mass. So you, may, you might say that it's the physical mass that always increases. And for completely spherical, spherically symmetric things, it's true. It's not true for the curved black hole. This is just another point. This is that there are processes, classical processes, called the Penrose process, where you can throw something in very close to the black hole horizon and comes out, slowing up down the rotation of the black hole, extracting energy from, from that region. So you can actually, the black hole can actually lose its mass a little bit. So mass does not increase, but area of its uh, and good. So, if a black hole has entropy and energy, then came Hawking, who said that uh, so energy and entropy is that there must be temperature. Okay, it's by the laws of thermodynamics, the derivative. Um, so, he said, let's calculate it. It must be a quantum effect because in classical. Yeah, the temperature is zero. So what he did was he, he took a black hole solution, and this we'll discuss a little bit, and he threw things at, he threw some scalar fields of photon at the black hole, and that's what comes out. And what he found, in, in the, using quantum field theory in the black hole background, what he found is that the, the, what comes out is exactly like that of the emission of a black body, a temperature, um, we're talking about the Hawking temperature, which is h bar times h phi dm. Okay, I'll just integrate this equation then stop. h bar times uh, over h phi gm. Okay, we'll discuss this a little bit later. Okay, h bar comes because you're doing quantum field theory. Okay. So now you get the, so this is uh, an absolutely beautiful calculation which all of you must study in Hawking's paper. So now if you have the temperature as a function of the energy, then you can integrate the first one. Right, so you can just say ds black hole equals dm over d, and that's h by gm over h bar. dm, that implies, you can integrate this, that s black hole is o pi dm squared over h bar. I'm going to write it again, that S black hole 
equals the area of the horizon. Remember, the radius was 2 gm. So that the area of the horizon divided by 4, um, g h bar, and I'm also going to put back a factor of c that you usually don't put. Okay, this is the famous vacant channel. You can also write this as area divided by 4 L prime squared. Okay. It's a, the, the cables, there's a cables one here which we will discuss here. Okay, entropy, when you integrate the first law, there's a cables close one. Okay, so that's the famous Wittgenstein Hawking formula. It says they're given a black hole. And this is a universal law in which applies to any black hole in general. Okay. That you measure the area of the event horizon and the in Planck units, the entropy, thermodynamic entropy of the area of the black hole. So of course the goal is to now to understand, put this together with Boltzmann equation. So when you put it together with the Boltzmann equation, the question is, is S of that hole equal to A B times the law of some number of <coughs> microscopes? Okay, so that's the uh, physical question. Uh, And that's what string theory has managed to answer in a uh, uh, third class of black holes. Okay, so good time to take a break. Okay, <coughs> so let's start. Any any questions from the previous discussion? Okay, I mean, apart from ones I got, um, you're always welcome to contact me, look me up at Keynes, and write me an email or something. Oh yeah, references, someone asked me about references. So today was supposed to be a review of GR and more basic stuff. Uh, and I did give references. Uh, and I just think of some. Um, so Ward's book is a good reference. Ward's book on GR. Um, There's a chapter on black hole thermodynamics. RG Real has a very nice course on black holes. In which I think the lectures are online. Um, Horowitz has a nice Horowitz, and it's kind of a it's not a textbook, but um, it's a book of like a collection of essays about black holes. And Horowitz has written the first chapter. That's also very nice. Starting from next time, I'll give so I'll, I'll send out references tomorrow or something. That that will be slightly less standard. Okay. Uh, so what I want to do now is tell you a little bit about <coughs> this loss of black hole. So there are, uh, there are three things I want to do. I don't know if I'll be able to. First, tell you about the law. Well, in, not that in, in, in any order. One, uh, discuss the loss of black hole mechanics, which are in classical GR. Secondly, Euclidean derivations of Temperature and thirdly the thirdly nothing. So just these two. Uh, we'll see how much we can do. So what I think I'll do is first just discuss this a little bit, then move to the Euclidean derivation, and then come back and discuss this if we have time. So what I'm skipping crucially is Hawking's derivation of the temperature, which according to me is the the only good clean derivation in quantum field theory of the temperature. Okay, it's, a, it's a beautiful paper. It's just that it's not worth reviewing it in, in 15 minutes. You have to work through it. I could do it in two hours, but I don't want to spend that now. So I really urge all of you to read that. And you're welcome to ask me questions, like even basic questions about it. Okay, I'm very happy to discuss it. Okay, that's your homework, if you want. Um, is that it? Is that not another? Derivation That's exactly the Euclidean okay. derivation. So the Euclidean derivative, derivation, what I'll, uh, derivation means, the only thing that was missing in the discussion so far was the derivation of the temperature. Right? Once you have the temperature, everything else follows. I right? integrate the first law and the entropy. Right? The temperature is the, is the key thing. The Euclidean derivation which I present is, is sort of a quick way to get the result, and it works beautifully, but somewhat magically. Now we really understand why it works. But there's some 
consistent rule which, which starting from, which was begun by um, the, uh, sorry, Gibbons and Hawking, um, and I'll discuss that. It's okay, very simple to do, but the physics is, is less clear. Okay, Hawking's result on the other hand is slightly more hardcore, um, but the physics is crystal clear. We have a black hole, I just repeat what it is, you have a black hole, you scatter particles of it, you throw something in, ask what comes out. So the um, so it's like this. Uh, I said I won't discuss it, but just just like that. So we throw something in, okay, and ask what comes out. So it's five plus and minus, and then you keep doing that until you go closer and closer to the horizon, okay. And then you're supposed to sort of integrate. You, you ask what comes out here as a function of what you throw in. And it turns out that the um, emission coefficient, so think of this as a scattering problem. There's a reflection coefficient, some of it comes back, and some of it is, uh, some of it is absorbed, okay, and some of it is um, emitted. So, so something like this. And the, the ratio of, of the emission to absorb, how do I say? The, the ratio of the outgoing wave to ingoing wave, um, as a function, it turns out to be a function of the mass of the black hole, and the function is exactly like the thermal spectrum, it's one over e to the beta times energy minus one. So that's the spectrum that comes out, without ever saying that it's a temperature. The calculation is really you have to follow the quantum field close to the horizon of the black hole, and then follow it out here. Okay, so that's a bit complicated, um, but it's perfectly well under control. All of you, I'm sure, can do it at this level. Okay. Um, so first let me discuss this, the classical loss of black hole mechanics. Okay, so just, just before Wittgenstein uh, had his entropy problem. So there is a notion called surface gravity, which I won't define very well, because again it will take me a long time to do it properly. <coughs> but roughly what it is, is, is the acceleration due to gravity. If you have, it's roughly what we call uh, small g, 9.8 meter per second square wave. Okay, it's that point. It's the force required for a unit mass uh, to be held at that point without falling. Okay, so it's a force, so imagine a black hole, some unit mass at the horizon and you tie a string to infinity, okay? And then you ask how much force do I need to keep it there at infinity. That turns out to be a quantity called that. For black holes of this type, which are the only ones we're going to study, minus half of r dt square plus dr square over f of r plus r square times the angle, these are the black holes we we'll study. This does not include the curved black hole because curved black hole rotates. There's no study for that. But for these black holes, the formula for the surface gravity is very simple. It's just half of f prime of r. Okay. Okay. And if you take that, Remember f of r for um, <coughs> Schwarzschild is 1 minus 2 gm over r. So 1 minus 2 gm over r, if you differentiate it, you get minus plus 2 gm over r square. And then when you put it at the horizon, which is 2 gm, you get 1 over 2 over uh, 4 g. M. So that should be 1 over gm, I got the factors wrong, half, this is a half here. Okay, so half of that would be that, and that's that, okay? So for the first thing that is that, for the extreme no, of that squared. Word, yeah, question? Is this uh, no, no squared, it should be m squared, <coughs> maybe there's a square root as well in the formula? r squared, r at the horizon is gm. Uh, no, 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 sorry, sorry. Yeah. I forgot the angle. Where? Sorry. So no, 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 no. Okay. Now, <clears throat> for an extremal black hole, remember that the f of r went like this: one minus r plus over r times one minus r minus over r. And extremal means that r plus equals r r minus. That means there's a double root okay, at the horizon. If there's a double root then the f prime of r at r, the horizon is also zero. Okay, that's, that's okay. 
Um, but here I've, um, so, so here I've just presented to you this fact. Uh, this sort of a half an hour, <coughs> a one hour derivation, what is kappa for general black holes, including curve. Okay, you have to define, um, you have to define this quantity in GR problem. I'm not doing that. Okay. Any of these references that I just said? Alright. Um, so the first, so the zeroth law is kind of, it doesn't, it's, it's, it's obvious for these black holes because it's spherically symmetric. The kappa is constant in the horizon. The way I said it, this is not a definition, there is a, there's some quantity called kappa which is equal to this. But here it's obvious that it's uh, spherically symmetric, therefore it's constant in the horizon. But that fact is true for more general black holes, even for curve. Although the horizon is not spherically symmetric, kappa is, is constant. That's like saying that the temperature is constant in equilibrium systems. Then there's a first law which we, which we kind of discussed, and if we have time, we'll go through it. That if you take a black hole and throw something at it, I mean, throw something into it, and if you measure the before and the after, and you ask, how does the mass of the of the black hole change? Okay, so roughly speaking, the, take the Schwarzschild for for instance. The Schwarzschild, the mass is just measured by the radius. Therefore, when you throw something in, the mass increases. Therefore, the radius increases, and therefore the area increases. Okay. And the fact is that for any black hole, uh, the increase in mass is proportional to the increase in area, which this constant is proportional. Okay. Well, this is also not obvious that it has to be proportional to the area with the constant. So that's like saying m equals TVS. Okay? And from that you can immediately see that kappa should be 1 over the temperature in this analogy. Yeah, I haven't derived any of these, I'm just telling you that these are results which were uh, uh, found after a lot of beautiful work by Bardeen, uh, Bardeen, Carter, and Hoffman. This is a paper called the loss of Bank. And it's the third one, which is the most interesting one, that the area um, that in any system, uh, sorry, in any process, in any process, you either throw something into the black hole or you perturb it, that's what happens, that it turns out the area of the horizon can never decrease. Okay? If you take one of our black hole solutions, then of course the area of the horizon is constant. Okay? So if you have, you have these kind of equilibrium situations, then there's nothing to discuss. This is a very, very general statement that you can throw any perturbation into the black hole and just measure it at two instances of time to find the area. It's not, yeah. So, I might discuss this. Meaning, I might try to derive this a little bit. Um, but first, I want to do the diffusion derivation of temperature, then depending on energy. This I wanted to discuss a little bit in detail. Let's see. Um, so just for the equation. <coughs> so this derivation has become, I mean, the, as I said, it works very well and, and it's become a proxy for calculating the temperature in many, many systems. It's a quick way to do it. If you ever work in this, you're going to use this. So that's why I think it's worth doing. So let's just, I just look for the Schwarzschild black hole. Okay, so remember the temperature was uh, 1 over 8, 8 pi g. Uh, 1 minus 2 g over r. I'll stop writing g. <coughs> um. <Okay>. Now, <coughs> the, so I'll just tell you what the procedure is. The procedure is this you continue this time with the imaginary direction, okay, i square of the time. So t goes to i times t Euclidean. You might have done this in quantum field theory. Actually, you must have done this in quantum field theory. Right? Anyone has not seen this? Has, how many people have seen this? Okay, 
Okay. Um, so do this. And then you look near the horizon. Okay, so when t goes to, so I'll just do it here. This plus and this becomes t. Okay. Let's look at the topology of this. So this is some r square uh, times the sphere. This is some function of r, and here's a function of t. Now notice that <coughs> this factor vanishes at the horizon. So if you're coming in from infinity, you should think of this as the size. So the factor outside uh, the t, I think t is going to be compact. We'll see that in a second. So this factor is the size of this compact, the radius is the r square of the compact. So the topology looks like this: that at infinity, this is one. Okay, and then when you go in, it starts decreasing until it vanishes. So this is the horizon. This is. This is what is called the cigar topology. You might you study the codes will surely come across. This is the cigar topology. Okay. <clears throat> so here I'm just drawing a two-dimensional slice in R and T. Of course, there's a S2 fiber topology, okay, which becomes infinite. Here. So the the idea is to demand that this Euclidean geometry is smooth. You demand analytics. So it's clearly when R is away from 2m, there's nothing to worry about. It's not perfectly analytic. Okay, R equal to 2m, this becomes singular. Okay, the curvature is fine. There's no issue with the curvature. We already saw that. But um, if you close the time circle like this with some period, then only for a certain value of period will you get a smooth um, cap. Okay, otherwise, you'll get a conical singular. Right, you take any space and you try to close it off like that with the periodic. If you, if you compact by one direction, right, you, have, you have to be careful. There's no conical thing. Right, so you do that. So R, let's say, is 2m plus rho square over 3m. In these corners, so I'm, I'm, I'm close to 2m. Right? <coughs> so the trick is you write d square is rho square. Uh, in this, in this small perturbation, 16 m square, rho square over 16 m square, d d square plus d rho square uh, plus 4 m square, <coughs> and we make that square uh, times 1 plus over. So it's a lot like the um, extreme of that form. The near horizon, um, there is there are two factors. One is S2, and this factor, if you share it, if you realize, um, is essentially just flat space. So rho square dt square is a constant plus d rho square. Right? d rho square plus rho square dt square. So that's the coordinates of two dimensional flat space. Okay, these, are, these are called the Rindler coordinates. This is for the inner space. Of course, it's not consistent. Here, there's still rho. It's not some constant factor epsilon. Okay. Nevertheless, near the horizon of a black hole, of the Schwarzschild black hole, there's Rindler flat space time space. Now, you want to demand smoothness. Smoothness means that that in this two-dimensional patch, so it's d rho square plus, so write the 2d part. So it's, so it's d rho square plus rho square times d t over 4m square. Okay. So that's like the angle. d rho square plus rho square d t plus square. And that, in order to be smooth in Euclidean two-dimensional space, the angle must be periodic with two pi. Okay, so you say that smoothness uh, t over four m should be identified. So t e four m t e four m to pi, which means that t e. So 
So now in order for the Euclidean Schwarzschild geometry to be smooth, the time circle must be identified. The Euclidean time circle must be identified to period A pi m. And that means that uh, <coughs> the temperature So that means <coughs> so that means that we have an equilibrium system temperature is one Well, it's very simple, it's just this. So indeed, so you should think of the periodicity. Another way to say it is T is T plus eight five m times i. The periodicity is an imaginary. Number. So for here, this T is an imaginary number. Or no. So think, start with T being the Lorentzian time. Okay. This derivation shows that T should be identified in the imaginary direction with radius 8 pi m. And that's what gives you the term. So T has the imaginary Yeah, yeah. Uh, <coughs> so that's what this is, because this is i. It's the Euclidean time derivation. So, okay, wait, are there questions about this? So this derivation is easy, but is, is the implication obvious or not? Yeah. Is it always true that the Euclidean time is identified in the beta? Huh, that's what I want to check. Is, is that clear? So I just said it as if it's obvious. But can I check how many people are happy with this? I mean, until then, we're all fine, right? That's just some mathematics. So once I say that time should be identified in the imaginary direction with radius beta, uh, then the fact that that implies there's an equivalent system with t equal 1 over beta, is that statement? Can you say if it's obvious to you? Can you say if it's not obvious to you? Okay, it doesn't add up the compliments. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, let me just go through that. It's just um, so this comes from from looking at from statistical mechanics. So uh, it's called the KMS condition. Uh, Martin Schwing. Thank you. Hugo Martin Schwing. What it is, is it's very simple, it's this, it's, um, let me just get my thoughts. Uh, <clears throat> okay, start with, uh, take a scale of field, so it comes like this, you start with the quantum field theory, okay, and then you do the same thing, t goes to i, t, e, okay, and if that, if there's a period, with some periodic, Okay, so yeah, let me back up. Start with the quantum field theory. Look at time independent configurations. Okay, and then go t goes to t plus i t. Okay. Um, one way to think about it is with the path integral, like you said, but there's another way which is faster, um, which is look at any two point function of the quantum field theory. Okay, imagine a quantum field theory of the scalar field. Okay. Um, and let me see. So let's write x comma t phi and y comma c. Okay, x and y are spatial coordinates. And look at the quantum statistical correlator. Okay, so take a quantum field theory at a finite temperature, one over beta. Um, what does this mean? By definition, this is a trace of rho uh, phi of x comma t phi of y comma zero, where rho is equal to the minus beta Hamiltonian over Z 
the space into the minus. So trace over the full Hilbert space. This is we're doing quantum field theory with some Hilbert space. The H is not the right. It's trace over the Hilbert space. Okay. Now, <coughs> so write this. It's one over Z. Uh, trace is the minus beta H phi of x comma t. And phi of x comma t, you write it using quantum field theory as the evolution operator as e to the i Hamiltonian times t phi of x comma zero e to the minus i, I Hamiltonian times t and y comma zero. And then you juggle it around. Uh, let's see. You write this as one more z trace of e to the minus. I need help with the signs and so on, so it should be uh, i. I want to write it as i and t plus or minus i beta p sub p times h. That's i times i on minus, so it should be i phi of x comma zero e of minus i. Same t plus i beta, and then I have another e to the minus beta. Okay? I just added and subtracted this, I mean, multiplied and divided by that. And now this equals, uh, now I take this block over there, so this is 1 over z, trace e to the minus beta <coughs> h phi of y comma zero uh, phi of y comma zero as I want it. Yeah perfect. So this now is phi of x plus y. Okay I just formally identify this as an evolution parameter. Okay so just like so it's multiplying the Hamiltonian, so it's evolving by that. Okay, so I get that. And that is just, I put this back in, this is just rho again. So that's just phi of y0, <coughs> phi of x, t plus i beta. Okay, that's it. So now you see that a two point function of this quantum statement system, equilibrium statement system at temperature beta. It's the same as the same for, as if phi is bosonic, uh, then uh, you can commute it fast. Uh, it's the same thing as t plus i beta comma c. Okay, that means that two point functions are periodic with uh, period i times beta in time. Okay? So that's the general. So in statmec, you have this understanding. And this can be made more formal using path and periods. I don't want to do that. Uh, I think this is the quickest way to see. If you have fermions, you'll pick up a minus sign because of this anti commutation. Okay? It's two point functions periodic with period. Okay? Now you see that because so take the Euclidean geometry here, and t is periodic with i times beta, beta equals that. Now if you put any two point function in the black hole background, that will inherit the periodicity of the geometry. So it will naturally have periodicity. Okay, that's that's it. And indeed, you can see that in the cigar geometry, if you put two fermions, then when you take two fermions around, okay, there's a psi one and psi two, and you bring it around, you pick up a minus sign also. This okay, so will also get the two point function of the fermion. Okay, that's that's the argument. Right, any any questions for this? Um, all right, so how much time do I have? I'll try to, well, I want to discuss this area law, if, so either zero or a little bit or... <laughs> Depends when pizza is coming. Depends on pizza and also what, all, 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 of, or what all of you want. I mean, five so. minutes. <laughs> okay, five minutes. minutes is not enough, so um, then I'll just... Ten minutes. Ten minutes, ten, ten, I'll try to uh, at least sketch for this. Yeah, go, I, I go, go for it. I go for the right. Okay, so I'll just go for it. If you have questions, 
shout out or I'll just, you can discuss it later. I'll just try to, it's, the thing is, the level of sophistication is slightly higher. Uh, okay, so the area formula. So, so the idea is this: you, you start with this. So let's take the okay. Now this was the horizon. Okay. Now let's just go for it and then we go through. So the horizon so far we've defined as where the light cone tips. Let's start for local way of identifying horizon. But as was already discussed, somebody has asked this, uh, maybe it was you, that, uh, yeah, sorry. That in fact, to define the horizon, you need the full Penrose diagram. It's a global concept. And the way um, Hawking and Ellis define horizons in their, in their book, uh, many of what I say is from, from that book, okay, so it's slightly more sophisticated, is that, so tick, so tick, so first, let's just uh, do it visually. What is the horizon? Fix tri plus future null infinity, and look at all the points to the past of it. Okay. These are all the points that are connected to future null to tri plus with a, a time like or a light like um, future directed. Okay, that's clear. Right? Because it has to be 45 degrees. And the horizon is the boundary of that region. Okay? And it's a null surface. So that's how horizons, there's one definition of a horizon which helps you to prove this clear. Okay? So to say that, you first define something called J minus of horizon uh, of type. So J minus of U is um, the set of all points uh, that can be reached from any point in U by the past directed causal curve. Causal means it can be time-like or like. Okay, so it's, it's basically this. So just okay, <laughs> sorry. Okay, I understand. Okay, and then uh, the black hole region. Think of the whole thing as some some manifold M. And the black hole region is defined as the manifold as the complement of J minus of square. So you look at the causal past of future null infinity, remove that, whatever is left is called the black okay. And we really taking you precisely have to intersect that with M and K of M. So that's the black hole. And the horizon is the boundary of that. Okay, that's what it is. In M. Now this definition gives you the following fact that it's a null hypersurface. Hypersurface means it's surface of full dimension one. Null means that it's normal, it's null everywhere. And it's what is called ruled by So I want to give you an idea of where the area theorem comes from. If the GR people are, they will know this. Uh, that stay on the ground. Room means, means the horizon can be so, um, any, co any uh, so there's a set of, it's called null congruence, there's a set of null GODC which are orthogonal, and any point can be labeled by which GODC you're on, and how much a fine parameter it takes you to reach. Okay. So rule means. And this means that these conditions, these I'm not deriving, this you should look at how king like this. That um, the horizon is what is called achron. Okay. What that means is that uh, two points on the horizon cannot be connected 
by uh, a time buffer. Okay. So I'll just tell you the idea of that. Not the idea, of course. The idea is uh, sorry, there's a further implication. That implies that, and that implies that the non zero seeks of the horizon cannot cross. Okay, so the idea is like this. Imagine we give you a counter example. So imagine minus dt square plus d omega to square. Three dimensional. So that's a sphere. The space is a sphere. There's a north pole and a south pole. And there are great circles. Okay, so the zero to six are the great circles. This zero to six cross, okay? because they cross. So I'm going backwards. So the last thing doesn't happen. Now zero to six do cross in this example. Because they cross, what can happen is you can go to the other side. So imagine a zero to six like it goes like this. You go here, and these two points can now be connected by a time lag joint, right? Because you can be going around, and this becomes shorter and shorter. Okay? So if now zero to six cross. Then it's not a chrono. Okay. That's, that's the idea. Uh, and now there's one discussion. So the key point is called the called the rights of the equation. Okay. And what it is is this. So if you have a family of null GD6, okay, take some space slice slice and ask what happens to it at a future point in time. This is a fine parameter. Okay, goes like that. Okay. There are things that measure how these GD6 behave. So in particular, if you have some GD6 confined to some area, you can ask what happens to that area. Does it increase or decrease? Or these GD6 can also and so, on. so th there are things which measure that, which are called um, the expansion, okay, which roughly says, which is roughly measuring that. Okay, I, won't, I won't give you the definition, it's easy, but. Um, and then there's something called shear. So expansion and shear. What shear does is, I shall tell you, it's not crossing, but how they twist. Um, so yeah, given some family of non six, you can write down explicit expansions, uh, expressions for, for, for example, I just write theta and not write that. Um, so h mu mu. So if you have some non six family of non six with tangent vector k mu, H mu is the induced metric, that's the expression. So just to give you a sense that that's something completely explicit. And then the right of the equation gives you, it's a geometric equation, which tells you how this um, how these geodesics behave. So it tells you the first of the differential equation. Theta and the shear and the curvature are related like this. Uh, <clears throat> another version of Reich algorithm equation is like you use Einstein's equation, you replace this with the matter stress tensor. So K mu is known, so you can, this is equal to that. R mu nu can be replaced by T mu nu. And then you assume some conditions in the type of matter that is there in your system. And one condition is called the null energy condition says that this is positive. Essentially what this says is that um, that if this were true for any time like vector, what it's saying is that any energy density is positive. This is even a weaker condition that only for light rays this is true. And putting all this together, if this is positive, this will be negative. This turns out to be positive because of the way because of the way the induced me metric behaves. So what this means is that uh, the theta d lambda is actually less than minus theta. Okay, so there's an equation which you can derive, inequality, 
you can derive purely for this expansion. Okay, how this non is non are expanding? And then it's almost finished to say that that if you integrate that inequality and this integrality lambda is theta squared. So this means that if theta of lambda equals zero plus theta naught is negative, then theta of lambda less than minus theta naught over two minus theta naught. It's easy to integrate, it's just been theta over theta square. And what this means is that as lambda goes to lambda is a fine parameter, lambda goes to two over theta naught, then uh, theta is lambda. Okay, so there's some singularity in theta. And what that means is that either space time itself is singular, but if you assume that doesn't happen, if you have, you're talking about some family of curves, and if the first derivative of that is singular, it means that they're crossing, the Jacobians. Right? So that means that zero is crossing. And <clears throat> so now if you apply to the horizon, apply this to the horizon, we know that theta must be positive always, because as soon as it becomes negative, it means that GOD6 cross. We saw that in the horizon, the GOD6 don't cross. Okay, that's some deep theorems. And if theta is zero, or theta is positive, then you write H, which is determinant of H mu nu. And you can see quite easily from the expression for theta that this expansion Theta is dd lambda of square root of h divided by square root of h, and therefore dd lambda of the area of the horizon is an integral of the horizon. Uh, so square root h divided by square root of h and then two x square root of h, uh, and that. So that's roughly how um, this area theorem goes. It's, it's, you have to set up, you have to define what this horizon is in the global coordinates. You have to study the geodesics that define the horizon. You, think, you realize that the horizon is, is essentially a family of non geodesics, and you ask how do they diverge. And what Wright Chaudhuri's equation is saying is that always that. Here I've not assumed anything about spherical symmetry or anything of the sort. It's a very good example. So that's just to give you a sense of, of you know, if you want to study the GR part of it, this is what you should be studying. The first law and the zeroth law also come from studying the same equation. Uh, I mean, this is very important. I think. So for the first law and the sorry, zeroth and first law, um, you don't look at inequalities. So if you just look at the horizon itself, um, let's say for static, so in the first law you look at equilibrium so static. So nothing is moving. There, some of these things vanish, and you can you can actually study the integral instead of the integral. When you study the integral, that gives you the change in mass uh, as a function of change in area. Okay. That's just to give you a sense. This last part was not supposed to be very detailed, but I hope it some sense. Okay, so I'll stop. Um, next time we completely switch gears. I want to start talking about microscopic states and string theory. So, essentially, no more GR for next time. There will be a lot of uh, string. Do you have any ideas starting from basic basic? Thank you very much.